Good morning, and welcome to Mission of Grace Church. I'm Pastor David. We welcome you in the name of God our Father and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we'd like to proceed to the Advent candles. These candles over here to my right are signs of the growing light of Christ which is coming again in all fullness into the darkness of our world. Until the dawning of that great day, we watch and wait in the Holy Spirit for Christ's coming, coming into the darkness of our world, lighting candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, and remembering the promises of God with prayer. Watch and wait for Christ's coming, like candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. Hear God's promise from Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. There's coming a new age with the second coming of Christ, in which everything is set straight. Everything will be as God intended it in the garden. And when we look toward that and remember that, our hearts are instilled with hope. Amen? And so this morning, it's the advent of hope.
first Noel The angel did say Was to certain poor shepherds In fields as they lay In fields where they Lay keeping the sheep On a cold winter's night That was so deep They looked up And saw a star Shining in the east Beyond them far And to the earth It gave great light And so it continued Both day and night And by the light Of that same star Three wise men came From country afar To seek for a King who was there to follow the star wherever it went this star drew nigh to the northwest or Bethlehem it took its rest and there it did pull stop and This prayer is for our spiritual needs, and I don't know about you, but one of the needs I have is for forgiveness. We sin in so many ways, don't we? Uh, Sometimes without thinking, sometimes with thinking, and um, that'll be, unfortunately, a plague of ours until we go home to be with the Lord, but hopefully it should be lessening as we grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. But let's pray. Lord, we come before you this morning, imperfect creatures, created in your image, but we've
polluted that image through our own sin and the sinfulness of our federal head, Adam. And Lord, we know that we need you so desperately. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us, each and every one of us, that you would cleanse us deeply from our sins, and that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may walk in your ways. And Lord, we pray that you would help us grow, that we would be able to resist temptation in a greater way, to overcome the sins that so sorely beset us and keep our eyes on the prize, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we know life is short. Eternity is very, very long. And so, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us and that one day you would take us into our heavenly home to be with you, world without end. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. Now it's time just to make mention of remembering for tithes and offerings. The needs of this church continue during this remote ministry. And there's a couple of ways that you can remember to give, either by visiting our website, missionofgracechurch.org, or mailing directly to 358 Pleasant Street, Gardner, Massachusetts. This is a parable spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's as timely today as it was when it was spoken. Hear now the word of God. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and let it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third, this one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone it will crush him. The word of God. Many people who rent out residential property can tell you horror stories of their experiences. A tenant tears out the front of the kitchen cabinets in the apartment and raises chickens on the shelves replacing the front cabinet doors with chicken wire. 
true story. Another tenant finds a mouse in the apartment during fall, so doesn't pay his rent for years. Another true story. Another tenant raises snakes and lizards in the apartment as if he's operating a zoo. The common theme of these horror stories is that the tenants act as if they were the ones that own the property rather than rent the property. As one judge used to say, it's outrageous. It's mind-boggling. Can you imagine tenants in a beautiful home who refuse to pay rent and who threaten to or beat up the owner's agents when they come to collect the rent? They argue, hey, we live here. This place is ours. The owner has the right to receive the rent and to have his property treated rightly. The question under consideration this morning is this. Who owns the vineyard? And let's make it more plain. Don't act as if you own because you really rent. We should live our lives as if God owns everything because he does. We remain accountable to God always. Doesn't matter what you believe, you remain accountable to God. Life should be lived to the full and enjoyed, but that can only be done when we live in reference to God. Living as a de facto atheist or an idolater is no way to live, but most do so. That is the message of the Word of God this morning to you and me personally. We're only renters. We don't own. Now, Jesus tells a parable about these wicked tenants of a vineyard. They wrongfully assumed ownership of God's vineyard. Now, this parable is one of only three that occurs in every synoptic gospel. The parable is basically answering the question earlier, last week, by what authority do you do these things, Jesus? So Jesus tells them this parable. If God owns the vineyard and Jesus is the son and rightful heir to it, then he's acting under God's authority. And the Jewish leaders have wrongfully usurped the authority of God, the rightful owner. Thus, the fundamental question, not only for the Jewish leaders, but also who hear the parable, including us, who owns the vineyard? Keeping in mind the answer to the question will determine how you live. Since God owns the vineyard, we must live accountably to him. Now, to understand the parable perhaps better, identify the characters. And this is most, the closest to an allegory a parable comes. It's not an allegory, but the owner of the vineyard, of course, is God. The vineyard is Israel. The tenant farmers are the religious leaders of Israel. The servants of the owner are the prophets. The prophets come and speak, look for the fruit. They're killed, mistreated, and then finally the son comes. And that, of course, is the Christ. Now, <clears throat> when they heard this parable, Jesus' audience would have immediately thought about Isaiah Five, where the prophet calls Israel God's vineyard and warns that he would lay it to waste because it produced only worthless grapes. Jesus shows that God expects fruit 
from his vineyard, but he emphasizes God's great patience and love and sending messengers and finally sending his son. If his people produce no fruit and kill his son, they will face terrible judgment. And that sounds like it's not repeatable, but it is. Even though they kill his son, he will triumph because he's the chief cornerstone or the capstone. He keeps the whole world together, right? You see a capstone in an arch in the middle that keeps the arch from falling. Jesus is the glue that holds the whole world together. Without him, the whole world would completely blow apart. Now, these things not only apply to ancient Israel, but apply to us because we've been grafted into the vine, beloved. Would you invest in planting a vineyard if you weren't going to receive any return? Would you buy stock, invest your money in stock if you were going to get no return, zero dividends, zero accrued value? It was a common arrangement for someone to have a vineyard and to rent it out to those who would be tenant farmers. Now, this isn't like a sharecropping thing or an abuse by a demanding owner. No, this is a great privilege to work in the owner's vineyard and have an opportunity to be there and to make a living, you know, a good living. They didn't have to plant it. They didn't have to build it. They just had to farm it. The owner wasn't a greedy tyrant, but a very, very patient person. God had done everything to provide for Israel. He has done everything to provide for his church. Now with Israel, he drove out the wicked nations and gave Palestine to his chosen people. He protected them from the nations around them. He entrusted leaders to them. And if they had been faithful, they would have harvested a great harvest. But instead, what they did is become idolaters and adopt the religions, the godless religions of the nations around them. They intermarried. And so these alliances formed. You know, we're greatly privileged. Do you realize that? We are so great. We're so rich. It is, I can't even believe how rich we are in relation to the rest of the world. And spiritually privileged. America is probably the most spiritually privileged people right now in all of history. We have God's word in our language, in multiple translations, right? With study notes and all kinds of things. We have an endless supply of helpful Christian literature, not only in printed form, but on the internet. You can get it for free most times. We have leisure time that we could spend in involving ourselves in spiritual things. We're blessed with adequate financial resources to support God's work here and around the world. With these great privileges comes great responsibility. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. We have a responsibility to bear fruit, folks. Bear fruit for the owner of the vineyard, for God. All of us are either living for ourselves and our own gratification, or we are living to bear fruit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us are living for our own gratification. We're either laboring for what we can get out of the vineyard for us, not usually what we can give to God. The wicked tenant farmers were working for themselves. The irony is 
we always find the most pleasure when we live to bear fruit for Christ rather than we, when we live for ourselves. When we live merely for ourselves, it is depressing ultimately. A man always found excuses to turn down his pastor's request to teach a Sunday school class to 13 boys. You see, on Sunday, he liked to go on the links. He'd like to golf and he didn't want to give that up. He said, Pastor, I can't do it. He gave multiple excuses. But then finally he said to the pastor, listen, Pastor, I love to play golf on Sunday with the guys. I don't want to go teach a class. Finally, he relented. And he went to teach the class. And after the sixth boy got saved, the man went to the pastor and said, thank you. Thank you for persuading me to serve because this is much more joy than I ever experienced on a golf course. God, the owner of the vineyard, expects fruit from you. But how can we be motivated to live accountably to him? You see, we got this problem, you and I. It's the same problem. I know what it is. We know what to do and not to do, but we don't carry it out. It's like trying to lose weight, right? We know what we should eat, not eat, when we should eat, all that stuff. We, maybe you've even gone to a nutritionist and you know the whole thing cold, but you just don't do it. You don't carry it out. So God is gracious because he patiently sends us messengers to motivate us to live accountably. That's happening this morning, right now. And it happened in the parable. God sent prophets. And they mistreated the prophets. They wounded the prophets. But they didn't listen to the prophets because the prophets all came back without any grapes. And so today, it's the same. But notice this unique supernatural patience of our gracious God. If you were a businessman and you sent the first prophet in and he came out with a beating and no rent, that would be it, wouldn't it? You would need to send second one or a third one or even your son. You would just call the whole thing to quit. And so... The word says, where sin abounded, God's great grace abounded even more. Can you imagine? What a wonderful thing. Now, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you should be able to look back at God's extravagant patience in your life and his dealings with you, and it ought to motivate you to serve him more zealously. How many times I have been self-centered, living for my own aims, not to bear fruit for the Lord. And yet he always keeps sending me messengers to get me back on track. God sends preachers of the word to proclaim the truth of his word. He gives us the Bible, which we can read for ourselves. And we see many other messengers in the church, friends and others who warn us by their lives and words of the need for fruitful living. Now listen. You listening? You're not listening. You listening? Am I alone? I'm stuck. I can't move. No. Go to God graciously sends us health problems to show us 
that we are frail and dependent on him. He graciously sends us signs of aging, gray hair, loss of hair, I don't know, no. loss of youthful strength, death of loved ones and friends to remind us that what is eternal is what matters. You want a, use, a useful exercise? Grab the greatest picture you have of yourself when you were young and beautiful and step in front of the bathroom mirror after you just got up where you're old and wrinkled, put the picture next to your head, look in the mirror, and you will have a sign. You will have a messenger. This was Dave in 1978. This is Dave in 2021. Time is running out, my friends. Ain't it? Has anybody got more time today than they did yesterday? I don't know about you, but I don't think so. The clock is set, and once after you're born, the day after, you start running out of time. That's how it works. These are gracious messengers given over and over again to a world that can't hear because its ears are stopped up by their own fingers. If someone says something and you can't hear them, and you're like this, well, of course you can't hear. Your fingers are in your ears. God is dealing with us, and he sends us graciously his final messenger, the son of the owner of the vineyard, the Christ. And they said, I know what I'll do, the owner said. I'll send my beloved son. They'll listen to him. And God knew that they wouldn't. But this is a parable, right? And this brings out an issue. The depth of God's amazing love. The son died for them. And you'd think they would say, oh, oh, the son's here. We better straighten out. It's the intractable evil of the human heart. We all have it. Jesus stands apart from all the other servants, from the prophets, from the pastors, from all the other things. And what they assumed was, because the son came, the father was dead. And under Jewish law, if there was no heirs, the first person to grab the property could have it. So they assumed that the father was dead, the son was coming, we'll kill the son, and we'll grab the vineyard, it'll be ours. That's what people do today. God is dead. Jesus Christ is just a man. The vineyard's ours. Oh no, you only rent. You thought you owned it. You thought you owned your life. You thought you owned your future. You don't. And so, the Christ comes and they kill him. And the great love in God sending his only son should motivate us to live accountably. But nonetheless, judgment is coming for everyone. Judgment is coming for each human being. If you have a soul, you will be judged. Doesn't matter what you believe, what you think. Oh, I don't believe that stuff, Pastor David. I don't care. You'll be judged. You were created by God. You're not an amoeba. You know? And despite what they did, Jesus pronounces the judgment that the owner of the vineyard will come and destroy these vine growers and will give the vineyard to others. And they said, may it never be. And it happened to them in AD 70, about 30 or so years later, Jerusalem was destroyed in the most 
terrible ways. And they were kicked out, so to speak, of the vineyard. And now the opportunity is for the Gentiles to be grafted in. That's you and me. Right now we're living in the time of the Gentiles, the Gentiles being grafted into the church. But for some reason, at least in North America, the grafting in is real slow. Not in other areas of the world, but in North America, very, very slow. And so we need to apply this, not just to the church out there, but to the church in here, okay? We miss the point if we think this parable was given to pagans. It wasn't. It was given to men who professed to know God, to national religious leaders, but they wrongly thought that they owned the vineyard. They thought it was their ministry. They were using it for their selfish purposes. As a result, they rejected Jesus' rightful place as the owner of the vineyard. This church, beloved, is not my church. There'll be a day when I won't be here. I'll be either up there or some other church. But this is not my church. And this church is not your church either. There'll be a day when you won't be here either. You'll either be up there or in some other church. It's not my ministry. It's not your ministry. Right? He's the owner of the vineyard. If he allows us to work in his vineyard, we're blessed. Any work that we do in the vineyard is not for us. He's the owner. We need to be careful because it's easy to start enjoying the grapes of the vineyard. It's personally gratifying to serve the Lord. You like it when people say nice things to you. You enjoy being used by God. All of this is fine as long as you remember it's his vineyard and that all that you do is for him. You see. But if you start serving for what you can get out of it and drift into thinking that it's your ministry, you've just usurped the rightful place of the owner. Doesn't that make you ill? Well, my church, my ministry. I can't do that. I just can't do that. And if I do do that, if it comes out of my mouth, it makes me ill. Because it's not mine. God expects fruit from his people. And your places of service may change. Things may change, right? But nonetheless, you're in the vineyard and God expects fruit from you. We don't try to control the church. It's not ours. Let the Lord lead the church and we should be following. You know? It's kind of the way I see it is the Christ should be leading the church and the pastor should be the first guy behind the Christ. You know what I mean? Jelly bean? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he will triumph. You don't want to fall on the cornerstone. Some people trip over the cornerstone and they break to pieces. And some people, the cornerstone falls with them and they're crushed. That is, everything was great in their lives, but one thing. They neglected Jesus Christ. They did not give him the homage, the worship, the praise, the priority that he deserved. Life is about what you do with the Christ. I don't care if you're 20 or if you're 5 or if you're 98. Life is about what you do with Jesus Christ. That's the issue. It's the defining issue. It's not about, you know, what college you go to. It's about what you do with the Christ. And not like once in time, but like continually. Right? A lot of people say to me, well, Pastor, 
you know, 20 years ago, I gave my heart to the Lord. What are you doing today? How does next week look? You know, are you serving the Lord now? Have you been serving the Lord? You know, it's not just a once in time thing. I gave my life to the Lord 10 years ago. I took it back to a year later. <laughs> and I've been living for myself ever since. And deluding myself that I gave my heart to the Lord. What's that mean? I gave my heart to the Lord. You know, if you're living for yourself. Ultimately, it's the struggle that all of us have. You see, living for ourselves don't work. Now, here's what we got going on, okay? And uh, it's this. The Bible tells us that the nature of the human heart is to think of itself as the owner of what we said should be. We should look at ourselves as tenants. We're all tenants acting like owners. Now, enter the self-help books. Oh, yes. They tell you, oh, no, 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 no. You are the owner. You are not the tenant. You can do whatever you want. You can decide your own values. You can decide what is right or wrong for you. You can decide what your sexuality should be. Maybe you should get some clues when you look in the mirror. But no, no, you can decide what it should be. You can do anything you want. You can live like the devil, but it's okay because it's your truth. That's what the self-help books are telling you. And that's exactly opposite of what the Bible and God is saying. Be careful of self-help books. Be careful of the prosperity gospel. Most of the people, almost all the people on TV are prosperity preachers. Not to be listened to. They're heretics. And I know people in churches, pastors, they tear their hair out because they come, people come for their sermon on Sunday, but listen to prosperity preachers on Monday through Saturday. There's nothing good on TV except for the knickknacks, y'all. You know what I mean? Watch out. Be careful. The self-help books, the prosperity preachers say, act like an owner. The Bible says, no, you're a tenant. And a tenant you will always be. You can say, I will do this. I will do that. The future is this. But you know it's not true, don't you? We all know innately, we can say, well, in five years I want to be here, in 10 years I want to be here, in 20 years I'm going to be here. We can all put a plan forward for our life. And you know what happens? God frustrates that plan so quickly and so easily. You believe you're in control. You're not because you're a tenant. I'm not in control of my life. Do you know what's going to happen tomorrow? You have no idea. You don't even know if the sun's going to come up tomorrow. Right? We lack perspective. We have an illusion of independence and self-sufficiency. We're not independent and we're not self-sufficient. And it doesn't matter what kind of a job you have or what kind of retirement account you have or how much money you have in the bank. You're not independent and you're not self-sufficient and you'll never be because your real condition is dependence upon God and contingency, right? You can say, I'm going to do this, this, and that. And the Bible says, you fool. This night, your life will be required of you. I've seen people do that. Have you seen them people too? They've had all these grandiose plans. And I was talking about somebody recently. They, they had just retired. And then they died. They had spent their entire 40 years 
for that moment when they would retire and travel everywhere. It would be great, you know, 20 years, whatever it is, we'll just be all over the world. And they died. They never got there. So the 40 years of slugging it, you know, that they went to save up for this period of time, they never got there because their plans were frustrated. God is control. He's in control of you, whether you believe him in, believe in him or not. It doesn't matter. I mean, it matters for you, but it doesn't matter to him in the sense he still controls your life. Right? Are you with me? And so what we do is we hate this message. We hate somebody saying, oh, you're just a tenant. Let's kill him. Let's kill God. It would be easier. Then we could be in control. That's what people do. Figuratively speaking, they kill God. I mean, you can't kill God, but that's what they do. I don't believe in God. I uh, believe in science. Or I don't believe, I, I, you know, well, my truth is that, oh. In their hearts and minds, they're killing God because they hate the message. You're not in control. This is not your life. God controls everything. So they kill him. That's why they don't want the Ten Commandments down at the courthouse. They know the implications. Get those things out of here. Get them away. That's why they want things that we never talked about 20, 30 years ago to become legal. Because if they're legal, they're now legitimate, you see, in their eyes. But in our eyes, never. Just because you have a legal right to do something doesn't mean it is the right thing to do. We know that, right? Life is a messenger. It continually comes at you and says, you're not in charge. You're not in control. You're the tenant. This is a gift that you have. But you really don't have what it takes to master it. This isn't yours. The conscience isn't yours. Your creativity isn't yours. Your sexuality isn't yours. Your intelligence isn't yours. Your relationships aren't even yours. These are all gifts from God to you, which you must treat responsibly and accountably. Amen? It's like, you know, an eight-year-old gets in the car and can't even see over the steering wheel and wants to drive the car. You can't drive the car. You're not in control. You know, remember McDonald's? In 1971, McDonald's came out with their best ad slogan ever. It said, you deserve a break today. And all the moms are going, you are so right. You are so right. It was one that went like this. You deserve a break today, so get up and get away to McDonald's. We do it all for you. Well, it turns out they really don't all for you, do all for you. Customers realized it. McDonald's does such a volume of hamburgers, they're all mass produced. If you want one different than off the rack, all the efficiency of the well-oiled machine breaks down, right? You know those, freeze, those little freeze-dried onions on a burger? They must reconstitute it with water. My wife hates them. Where are you, wife? She hates them. And she was the first person in my life that I had ever saw that went to McDonald's and had the courage to say, could I have that without onions? I'm like, oh, God, no. It's like, would you mind parking your car over there, sir? You're, Matt, you're, you're, they make you go to the purgatory of fast food. You don't know if you're ever going to get out, man. You're waiting, right? For someone to take a burger and to make it without onions on it. Some of them probably used to just like, well, like, go like this. Here you go. I can taste onions on this burger. This can't be right. 
So they have to actually make it without the onions. Best thing you could say was, I'm allergic to onions, and I'll, you know, I'll go into anaphylactic shock, so can I have one without onions, please? So anyway, Burger King came in and said, got him. We got him. They picked up on the problem, and they said, have it your way. McDonald's is oh, you deserve a break today. And Burger King is, have it your way at Burger King. Hold the pickles, hold the lettuce. Special orders don't upset us. All we ask is that you let us have it your way. Have it your way. Have it your way at Burger King. We'll do whatever you want. Just don't go over there. One of Elvis Presley's most beloved songs in his concert repertoire was, I Did It My Way. He performed the song with such passion. It's as if the song was thematic of his entire life. Here's this young poor boy from Tupelo, Mississippi, who sang his way to riches in global fame. He went from a pauper to the king of rock and roll. But the American dream quickly turned into a nightmare. Elvis, trying to dull the pain and pressure, became hooked on prescription drugs and eventually died at age 42 of an overdose in very poor health. Tragically, Elvis did it his way, and his way ended in death and destruction. Don't act as if you own, because you really only rent. We should live our lives if as if God owns everything. Well, because he does. He owns me and you. We should remain accountable to God always. And listen, not that I'm preaching something that's horrible. I'm preaching something that's freeing and true. That life should be lived to the full and enjoyed. Don't get me wrong. But that can only be done when you live with reference to God. Can I get an amen? I don't think you believe it. Let's pray. Are you ready? Lord, we thank you for your word, which speaks so clearly and eloquently to us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your great grace. And Father, help us to live with this mindset. Help us, Lord, to live as your subjects, as ones that are under authority, yours. And may, Lord, you help us as we walk each day. Protect us. Fill us, Lord, with your hope. Fill us, Lord, with your love. Fill us, Lord, with your gospel. This we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Cause
But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Amen and amen.